We don't just <clears throat> want to do it nilly-willy and, and stick things in the ground and walk away from it. And of course, we're obviously treating the symptom and not the cause of climate change. It's kind of maybe a defeatist attitude, but we're not going to reverse it at this point. Uh, this just quickly, uh, the graph on the left shows the, uh, the, the current distribution, or, or uh, this is a Canadian publication, of um, where white pine would be planted, and then on the right is the projection of where it would, should be planted like 20, 30 years from down the road. Uh, one paper I read uh, assumed or estimated that the natural migration of, uh, for most tree species was 50 kilometers a century. And we're looking at at least 10 times that is needed, actually. If you do the math, I think it comes out to 12 times the, the, the speed that would be needed. So that just points to the obvious, that it's unlikely most of these tree species are going to be able to move on their own. You know, herbaceous and shorter life species might have a better, a better chance, uh, but still not likely. So some of the existing policies, without going into details, a lot of the Canadian provinces have uh, put forth policies for moving commercially important species, where they're encouraging the movement of important tree species, either uh, latitudinally or elevationally, or a couple of seed zones, as they, I think they use. That's more of a Western phenomenon. And uh, the only state I actually came across was Oregon, uh, that they uh, recommended that climate change be considered when they're in forest management plants. And most recently, I've been contacted a couple times by the state of Minnesota, who's apparently working on a policy, and they've been, uh, they've been asking us for, for uh, input on that, which is uh, kind of flattering, but I don't really have much to tell them. <laughs> uh, so getting to the nitty gritty here, the Vermont guidelines, we, we came up with a five-tiered approach. And uh, again, these are just guidelines. There's nothing mandatory here. It's not, it's not even a, uh, a policy. Uh, so tier one would be in a significant or rare natural community or an old, an old growth forest, or if there was a connected block where we think uh, plants could move on their own, there would be no assisted migration, no at, at this point. We would allow self-adaptation. Uh, tier two would be uh, moving plants or seeds within their current range using local stock. So it would be essentially planting uh, say like red oak at the uh, maybe in south facing slopes at the extreme northern edge of their range, like up in the Northeast Kingdom where they might do well in the next 10, 20, 30, 50 years. Uh, the third one, and this is getting, as you can see, it's getting more and more controversial as we go, we go down, the, the, down the list. Uh, the third tier would be essentially the same as the second tier, only changing the composition of the, of the forest. And one example I think that uh, this was based on was maybe um, planting red maple in, in black ash swamps. And, and this is more a result of, of um, emerald ash borer, obviously, than climate change, although you know, maybe, maybe there's some relation there. But as, as pests wipe out trees, we might plant other species to kind of maintain the ecological integrity of that community, even though the, the players are changing. We've, and <clears throat> the fourth one would be moving um, plants or, or seeds that just expand just beyond the edge of the range. And that's something what some of the Canadian provinces are doing, that is moving things up, species up elevationally and also latitudinally. And then number five is kind of that gets into the realm of species rescue, which is you know, long distance transport where you're taking, like what the Toria guard, uh, guardians are doing, taking things from uh, from northern Florida and, and sticking them up in, in the Carolinas or up as far north as Ohio. And that's, um, yeah. Um, this is just essentially uh, the, same, the same scenario, only in a, um, more in a table. Uh, the one thing I didn't mention on the, the last one, if you look on the, uh, the lower right, it's kind of got cut off. I think this is an older version I, I sent by mistake. But anyway, uh, GMO plants would be considered in tier five. And if, clearly what I'm thinking of is American chestnut. If there's GMO chestnuts, we would, be, um, we would treat that as something we'd want to look at very, very carefully. And that would need to be uh, vetted within, within the agency, within the, uh, it's something you know, the Endangered Species Committee might look at, as, as well as a number of other groups. It's not something we would consider lightly. And then uh, lastly, 
I just wanted to touch on, this is a policy that the New England Plant Conservation Program put together. And just quickly, a little bit of background. Uh, New England Plant Conservation is a consortium of all the state heritage programs in New England. So all the state botanists, if you will, uh, uh, members from academia, and I think most of the federal agencies are, um, are represented, the Forest Service, um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service as well. So it's, it's a, a, lot of, um, a lot of botanical expertise. And they came up with this, um, this three-tiered approach towards assisted migration. And that is that it's a tool that should be considered on a case-by-case -case basis. We shouldn't just dismiss it as, nope, we're not doing that. We should look at each, each one, each possible scenario. And that uh, the second tier would be, the second um, prop or condition would be that New England endemics should be the ones, should have the highest priority. And that's, that's pretty intuitive that we would want to um, focus on things that are endemic to New England and that it, ones that are more vulnerable to climate change. And then the third one is maybe not as obvious, that we here in New England don't have a lot of endemic plants. I mean, we're in the glaciated Northeast uh, compared to, say, the Appalachians. So we're much more likely to be recipients and not donors. And that's something to keep in mind. It's more likely people are going to be coming to us and say, hey, can we move some of these plants to you rather than us moving them north? Uh, so I just want to finish with a quick dis uh, disclaimer uh, in case anybody got the wrong impression. Um, ANR, Natural Resources Agency, is, is not by any way um, advocating assisted migration. But that said, I think it's important, we think it's important that the discussion uh, occur and that we, be con we consider this at least as a potential tool uh, and you know, look at it on a case-by-case -case basis. And you know, nobody knows quite how bad this is gonna be. Um, I mean, the one, the one neat side of, of climate change, if I mean, if I can go there, is that it's sort of an exciting time to be an ecologist because nothing has ever happened like this before. And you know, we're gonna be able to see things that normally happen in geologic time in our lifetimes. And that's, I mean, it's scary, but it's kind of, it's kind of exciting too. So, thank you. for questions. Yeah, we have time for questions. And yeah, thanks um, to Bob and all the folks who worked at that. I had, um, it is really great to have a state who's thinking that proactively about things, and I think it provides a really great just structural framework for even thinking about the issue. Um, so yeah, we have a few minutes for questions, and I encourage people to ask. Okay, we have one in the back. Are you going to shout your question, and we'll repeat it? Uh, good question, John. Uh, you should have asked me this beforehand, so I had a minute to think about it. We have had extirpations in Vermont. There's um, a species of milk vetch, um, Astragalus rubinzii, variety rubinzii, that was at Winooski Falls, but that was due to a dam construction and flooding. Um, I guess I can't think of a species that has been extirpated. Uh, it may have been part of it. I, I would say maybe Deer browse is, is maybe a bigger factor. Uh, I mean, it, it's probably a multiple number of reasons for Calypso, but I would say herbivory is probably the bigger culprit in that case, but nobody's really studied it. Um, it, may, it may be too soon. Uh, mm -hmm. I think maybe we've had some local extirpations of populations, and some, there's a, um, um, a, a species, the anemone multifida, the, um, Sorry, I'm spacing out on the common name. You'll have to forgive me. That occurs only at, um, on, on the Winooski River. And uh, Jerry Jenkins, who may or may not be here, has been monitoring that for years. And the population is declining big time. And what he thinks, and he's been studying this pretty closely, is that it's just not getting the recruitment. Because it gets these, it gets these dry years, and it kind of knocks the plants back. And they're just not able to recover. So the plants, they're going along, and then they get hit with a really dry summer that none of the seedlings can survive. And then it, it plateaus for a couple of years, and then you get another dry summer, and it drops again. So that's kind of climate change um, induced, but it's still hanging on. Good. 
just because, well, for, I'm talking about species rescue, for species that are gonna go extinct. We don't have a lot of endemics in Vermont and in New England. And the Smokies have, you know, you look at the number of endemic plants in the Smokies where they haven't had glaciation, so the you know, speciation has had a lot more time to occur. That, that's the only reason. Mark? Oh. So you, you, mentioned, you mentioned GMOs. I know the Canadians have been working on GMOs for productivity of forests and for important commercial trees. Is any of that happening south of us? Anybody know? You might know that the Maria might know about yeah. timber species that are that the U.S. researchers have been working on? I don't know. No, that's. Sounds like a question for somebody else. I, I, I don't know <laughs> of any offhand. Um, there is one particular. Yeah, I don't know of any offhand. Mm -hmm. I think there were a few in the back. Yeah, uh, Ken? Um, I'm wondering, this is a little bit off topic, but um, instead of thinking about species rescue as is Nepcot thinking about circling the wagons around significant areas, for example, red spruce habitat that provides real good um, biological diversity and is very environmentally healthy right now, and accelerating the growth of Yeah, good question, Ken. Uh, I guess the short answer to that is, when does it start becoming gardening? You know, if it's if you're going to have to do management in perpetuity, it's like it it becomes sort of like gardening. I mean, I can see doing that in the short term just to kind of maintain, you know, so species. Obviously, it's it's much preferable to extinction, but in the long term, I mean, we can't be creating little rare plant gardens all around, you know, the Northeast. Um, it's just not logistically possible, I don't think. I mean, in a few, you know, you know, a few instances, I think it would work. I mean, I think we should try to keep Mount Mansfield, you know, as, as alpine as long as we can. But at some point, it's maybe futile. There was one question in the back. Yeah, we have time for one more. Uh, in answer to your first question, I, we did, I tried to cover that. You'll notice the, um, the, the where was it, the tier one where the, there wouldn't be uh, any, or was it tier five, anyway, uh, where there wouldn't be any assisted migration would be in uh, intact and rare natural communities as well as uh, commu uh, communities that had, um, you know, intact landscapes and where there were corridors where plants could probably migrate on their own. And those were going to be kept off limits for the exact reason you said, that hopefully things could sort themselves out on their own. But it's more the, the fragmented features that we're looking at. Um, I think I'm going to pass on your second question, because uh, there's people here that are more familiar with that than I am. In fact, I think there's a talk this afternoon on Vermont conservation design, and they're going to actually talk on that, that very thing about setting aside uh, ecological reserves in the state. Thank you.